The purpose of my talk today is primarily to speak to those who sense that there is something deeply wrong in the Catholic Church. If we compare what the Catholic Church was like in its 2,000-year past, as opposed to its present state, we know that there has been some profound transformation. No one would deny that the changes of Vatican II have brought about very, very impressive and deep changes. What is presently known as the Catholic Church in the view of people in the world does not profess the same dogmas and moral teaching, does not have the same liturgical practices, and does not have the same essential disciplines as the pre-Vatican II Church. In this talk, I will explain what is wrong, the causes of these problems, and what a Catholic ought to do during these times. Let us look first at the present condition of the Catholic Church as opposed to its condition before the Second Vatican Council. First, there is the loss of faith and the loss of unity of faith. One of the most striking contrasts is the loss of faith among Catholics. The virtue of faith is not a mere feeling about God but it is an intellectual assent to truths which are revealed by God and proposed by the teaching authority of the Catholic Church. In order to be Catholic, it is necessary to be baptized, as Pope Pius XII teaches, and it is necessary that you profess the truths which are proposed by the Catholic Church and hold them to be true. Now, let us look at the state of the profession of faith among those who call themselves Catholics today. And these are figures that you can research yourself on the Internet, and they are from well-conducted polls. <clears throat> 55% hold that abortion should be legal in most or all cases. The murder of children. 63% say that Roe versus Wade, permitting abortion, should not be changed. 82% say that artificial birth control is morally justified, even though it is condemned by the Roman Catholic Church. 70% do not believe in the real presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. 33% do not believe that Christ rose from the dead. 65% of Catholics are pro-choice. 70% say that homosexual acts are morally justified. 57% say that same-sex marriages ought to be permitted by the church. 54% think that living together before marriage is not sinful. 62% say that Catholics who are divorced and remarried without an annulment should be able to receive Holy Communion. 49% say that marrying again after divorce without an annulment is not a sin. Four in ten Catholics have lived with a romantic partner. And to bring yet more evidence of the change that has taken place, the dogmatic and moral change, let us see some of the things that have been said recently by uh, what is seen to be Pope Francis <clears throat> by the Catholic world and the world in general. <clears throat> On July 29th, 2013, when asked about a homosexual priest, or someone allegedly homosexual with a boyfriend working in the Vatican, what he thought about that, he said, who am I to judge? 
on October 1st, 2013. He said, proselytism is solemn nonsense. It makes no sense. Proselytism is the effort by the Catholic Church to convert people to Catholicism, which has been done for all centuries at the command of Christ, going therefore teach ye all nations, baptizing them, and so forth. He says that's nonsense. We need, he says, to get to know each other, listen to each other, and improve our knowledge of the world around us. He said, also, I believe in God, not in a Catholic God. There is no Catholic God. It's a quote. On November 24th, 2013, he said, concerning Muslims, we must never forget that they profess the, to hold the faith of Abraham, and together with us they adore the one merciful God who will judge humanity on the last day. As if we worship the same God as the Muslims who deny the Holy Trinity, who deny the divinity of Christ, and who say that Christ did not really die on the cross. It's in the Koran. On March 5th, 2014, <clears throat> he said the church should support civil unions, meaning of those living together and also of homosexuals. Um, <clears throat> he said we have to look at different cases and evaluate them in their variety. On March 10th, 2014, <clears throat> uh, Cardinal Dolan of New York said, uh, quoted Pope Francis, so this comes from Cardinal Dolan, that the Catholic Church should not dismiss gay marriage, but should study it. On April, 20, on April 3, 23, 2014, he told a woman on the phone in Argentina, he called her from his own cell phone, and told her that it's, uh, she was divorced and remarried for 20 years, 20 years of remarriage. And he told her it's okay to take Holy Communion saying, a little bread and wine does no harm. And <clears throat> on June 29th of that same year, 2014, he said, communists are closeted Christians. On October 5th, 2014, he said, the world has changed and the church cannot lock itself into an alleged interpretation of dogma. On October 9th, 2014, he said, but God does not exist. Do not be shocked. So God does not exist. There is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are persons. They are not some vague idea in the clouds. This God spray does not exist. The three persons exist. On December 2nd, 2014, he compares Islamic terrorists to Christian fundamentalists. Christian fundamentalists are people who hold to the traditional faith. He has constantly criticized them and called them Pharisees and, and all sorts of other names. He said, we have our share of them, meaning the fundamentalists. All religions have these little groups. March 15th, 2015, he said, what happens to that lost soul? Will it be punished? He's referring to people who die in the state of mortal sin. He said, there is no punishment but the annihilation of the soul. All the others will participate in the beatitude of living in the presence of the Father. The souls that are annihilated will not take part in that banquet with the death of the body. Their journey is finished. So that means those who die in the state of mortal sin do not go to hell, but they are just annihilated, which is a heresy. On July 9th, 2015, he denied the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, saying, he, meaning our Lord, takes a little bread and some fish, he blesses them, and then gives them to his disciples to share with the crowd. This is how the miracle takes place. It is not magic or sorcery. With these three gestures, Jesus is able to turn a mentality which discards others into a mindset of communion and community. And we can imagine this now. 
we can imagine how they kept passing the loaves and fishes from hand to hand until the food reached those who were the farthest away. Jesus managed to generate a current among his followers. They all went on sharing what was their own, turning it into a gift for the others. That is how they got to eat their fill. Incredibly, food was left over. They collected it in the seven baskets. Whereas the traditional teaching concerning that miracle is that Christ, through his divine power, reproduced the bread, the, the bread and the fish. Here it's just a big picnic where everyone shares, and that's the point of that gospel story. On July 12th, 2015, <clears throat> he accepted a communist crucifix, that is a crucifix made with a hammer and sickle on it when he was in Bolivia. And when asked about it, he said, I understand this work. For me, it wasn't an offense. I carry it with me. On September 5th, 2015, <clears throat> uh, he said in a video message to theologians, doctrine is not a closed system devoid of dynamics able to raise questions, doubts, inquiries. On September 15, 13th, 2015, he said concerning, uh, in an interview uh, uh, with an evangelical Protestant who was a personal friend of his, he said, fundamentalists keep God away from accompanying his people. They divert their minds from him and transform him into an ideology. So in the name of this ideological God, they kill, they attack, destroy, slander. Don't forget he's referring to people who hold to Catholic dogma when he says this. Practically speaking, they transform that God into a Baal, an idol. No religion is immune from its own fundamentalisms. In every religion, there will be a small group of fundamentalists who work, whose work is to destroy for the sake of an idea and not reality. And reality is superior to ideas. It's obvious we're mistreating creation. We're not the friends of creation we treat her sometimes like the worst enemy. September 24th, 2015, <clears throat> uh, Cardinal Daniels, one of the papal delegates chosen to attend the upcoming synod at that time on the family, confessed to being part of a radical mafia reformist group opposed to Benedict XVI. He said that he was part of a secret club of cardinals opposed to Benedict XV, he, uh, 16th. he called it a mafia club and it bore the name of St. Gallen. The group wanted a drastic reform of the church to make it much more modern, that's his words, and for Cardinal Jorge Bergoglio to head it. The group, which also comprised Cardinal Walter Casper, and the late Jesuit Cardinal Carlo, Carlo Maria Martini ha, uh, was uh, also um, uh, was documented in Austin Ivray's biography of Pope Francis, the great reformer. On September 25th, uh, 2015, the openly homosexual actor, journalist, comedian, and vocal supporter of same-sex marriage, Mo Rocca, served as a lector that is a reader at Pope Francis's Madison Square Garden Mass. <clears throat> um, uh, he said concerning fundamentalists, again, what he calls fundamentalists, fundamentalism is a sickness that exists in all religions. We Catholics have some, not just some, so many, who believe that they have the absolute truth and they move forward with calumnies, with defamation, and they hurt people. They hurt, and I say this because it's my church, also us, all of us. It must be combated. On December 12th, 2015, he said Catholics should not try to convert Jews. Quote, Catholics should not try to convert Jews and should work with them to fight anti-Semitism 
the Vatican, uh, <clears throat> uh, unquote, in, uh, in, quote, in concrete terms, this means that the Catholic Church neither conducts nor supports any specific institutional mission work directed towards the Jews. <clears throat> On January 7, 2016, uh, in a prayer video, he uh, uh, stressed interfaith unity, and in this video, and you can see it on the internet, uh, he had a, a Muslim, he had a Buddhist, and he had a Jew, and then a, a Catholic priest. And they all came together and, and expressed their beliefs. And he said, quote, many think differently, feel differently, seeking God or meeting God in different ways, in this crowd, in this range of religions, there is only one certainty that we have for all. We are all children of God. So the only certainty in the Catholic religion then, which we share with, with everyone else, is that we are all children of God. That means all of the other Catholic dogmas are subject to doubt. <clears throat> <clears throat> and on January 21st, 2016, a Lutheran group from Sweden uh, was given Holy Communion in St. Peter's Basilica. And on February 18th, 2016, uh, he says that contraception is morally acceptable uh, in regions hit by the Zika virus. And this was confirmed by Father Lombardi, and, and he said that... Uh, that, that contraception, artificial contraception, is permissible in certain cases. It's absolutely condemned by Pope Pius XI and even by Paul VI. <clears throat> so that is the present condition of the Catholic Church, uh, that is, of those who profess to be Catholics and those who profess to be the Catholic hierarchy. And, and so my point is that there have been tremendous changes in dogma and morals since Vatican II. I mean, imagine Pope Pius XII saying the things that we just heard from the mouth of Bergoglio. And just yesterday, he said that cases of, of divorce and remarriage will be judged case by case whether they can receive communion or not. <clears throat> so, now, let us look at the decline of the life signs of the Catholic Church since the Council. When Pope Pius XII died, the life signs of the Catholic Church were very, very strong in 1958. Now, these figures are from 1965, which is the close of the Council, most of them, and they can be verified. You can look for them if you want, uh, to show you the general decline of the life signs of the Church since the Council. Now, there has, in this country, we're talking about this country alone, there is a 68% increase of those who call themselves Catholics since 1965 and a 48% increase in those who are enrolled in the parish. Now, you have to keep that in mind because normally there should be a, a, an equivalent and proportional rise of the life signs in accordance with the rise of the Catholic population. But we're going to see these figures, you have to compare them against what they should be, that they should be 68% higher, 48% higher than what they're showing. <clears throat> so uh, we're talking about numbers of seminarians, ordinations, baptisms, conversions, priests, nuns, religious brothers. The total number of priests since 1965 has decreased by 36%. And the average age of priests in 2014 was 63. At present, there are more priests aged 80 to 84 than from 30 to 34. At present, there are approximately 37,500 priests in this country. That number is expected to drop to 31,000 in 2020. Priestly ordinations are down 48% since 1965. The number of major seminarians is down 56% since 1965. 
the number of religious sisters is down by 73%, and their average age in 2014 was mid to late 70s. So they are being virtually wiped out. The number of religious brothers has de declined 63% since 1965. There are presently 4,200 of them, and this number is expected to drop to 3,100 by 2020. They are dying off. The number of parishes without a resident priest is up by 643% since 1965. One in five parishes is without a resident priest, and by 2020, it is expected to increase to one in four. I knew a priest in Germany, a, a priest connected with the diocese in Germany, who was the pastor of four churches, four parishes. The percentage of diocesan priests in active ministry was 94% in 1965, and only 66% in 2015. That's because of retirements. There might, be many, there might be 100 priests, say, but if many are retired or sick or in some way not active. But the active ministry was at 94% in 1965. That dropped to 66% in 2015, which is a drop of 30%. <clears throat> the number of active diocesan priests per parish is down 50% since 1965. The number of primary school-age children in religious education is down by 24% since 1965. Secondary school-age instruction is down by 53%. The number of Catholic elementary schools is down by 50%. Half the schools have closed. The number of students in Catholic elementary schools is down by 69%. The number of Catholic secondary schools is down by 21%. The number of students in Catholic seven, uh, secondary schools is down by 15%. The number of Catholic colleges and universities is down by 26%. The number of students enrolled in Catholic colleges and universities is up by 91%. That's the only up. The number of baptisms of infants, now this is staggering, is down by 47%. The number of adults baptized, and this is also staggering, is down by, by 66%. That means adults who are converting, because nearly all adults who were converting to the Catholic faith were baptized conditionally. So conversions are way, way down. The number of marriages, and this is also shocking, is down by 58%. Now don't forget the Catholic population is up by 68% but the marriages are down by 58%. The number of Catholics going to church once a week, that is usually either Saturday or Sunday now, uh, in Sunday, uh, on Sunday, because that was the only day to go, in 1958 was 75%. 75% of Catholics went to Mass on Sunday in 1958. It dropped to 55% in 1965, and in 2015 it's at 24%. In France, it's 5%. Europe has figures that are far, far worse than what I'm telling you. Europe is practically devastated from the point of view of the practice of the Catholic faith. <clears throat> A 2010 <clears throat> Pew Forum study found that 45% of Catholics did not know the church's teaching on the real presence. And why don't they know it? Have they not been taught it? Do they speak about it from the pulpit or in the catechisms? Why does practically half of the Catholic population not know that Christ is present in the Holy Eucharist? Only 30% of those raised as Catholics are still practicing. Nearly 80% of cradle Catholics are no longer Catholic by the age of 23. That means they go through the 
modern Catholic system, 80% of them drop out, and only 20% call themselves Catholics. Then there is the new discipline concerning marriage annulments. In 1939, the total number of marriage annulments worldwide was 90, 90. In 2007, the total number was 58,322. 60% of these were given in the United States, which comprises only 5.9% of the world's Catholic population. Of the 35,000 annulments given in 2007 in the US, 7,355 were granted according to documentary process, whereas the rest, 27,654, were granted according to judicial process. And I'll, I will explain that in a minute. And of these, the last group, 27,000, 99.6% were granted for defect of consent. Documentary process simply means this that if, it, if you can prove by document that your spouse or your supposed spouse was previously married or is related to you as a first cousin or something like that, that's known as documentary process, and that was always an easy task. Oh, yes, we see that there was a mistake. You are not married. But if there is something to establish, some fact to be established, for example, typically if somebody says, my, my father-in-law had a gun to my head, and I had to marry. That, you cannot say that to a priest and, and have him respond to you, oh, well, then you're not married. That fact has to be established in an ecclesiastical court. It has to be tried. There has to be witnesses. There are judges. They listen to everything. It is argued just like a civil case, pro and con. And then, and that is known as judicial process. Now, of these, 99% were granted for defect of consent. This means that there was a radical change in the church's attitude toward annulment. Before Vatican II, a marriage annulment was something extremely rare. We saw only 90 worldwide in 1939. An annulment is a declaration by the church that because of some intrinsic defect in the marriage contract, the marriage never actually took place. Of course, such an event would be very, very rare and would have to be proven either by document, as I said, or by judicial trial, but whereby certain facts would be brought to light and tried for their truth in an ecclesiastical court. Since Vatican II, the whole process has gone wild. And people are receiving marriage annulments for being psychologically incompatible or because they were too young to make a decision. Now, if, that, if they can say that in 99% of the cases, what married couple would not say at a certain point in their lives, we are psychologically incompatible? What married couple could stand before a priest and say, we have never had a fight. We have never <laughs> thought it was a mistake perhaps to get married. You know, that goes through everyone's mind, especially in the first year of marriage. And so to, to use these psychological arguments means that the door is open to, to dissolving the marriage, to saying, it, more than dissolving it, saying it never took place in the first place. And and so it is that discipline has, has just gone wild since Vatican II. The Catholic Church holds to the indissolubility of marriage. And historically, annulments were very, very rare. You remember that Pope Clement VII would not grant an annulment to Henry VIII and was willing to see England go off into schism rather than to grant that annulment. In this same year of 2007, all of those who persevered in the, uh, of all of those who persevered in the annulment process, 98% received annulments from diocesan courts. That means only 2% were refused. 
There was a comment by one of these diocesan judges in back east, in a diocese back east, who said, there is no marriage that I cannot annul. And there was a priest who came to us from the Novus Ordo, from a Midwestern diocese, and he said that, and he's now a traditional priest, he said that he was told repeatedly by the vicar general to go and get more annulments, to encourage people to have annulments because it brings in money to the diocese. That means that the priest, instead of trying to put together the marriage, should encourage that they split up and should encourage that they, they uh, seek an annulment in order to enhance the coffers of the diocese. Now that's his, I heard him say it. Then there is a new liturgy. One of the most noticeable changes of Vatican II is the liturgy. The Catholic Mass of the centuries has changed abruptly into something that resembles a Protestant supper service with all references to particularly Catholic doctrines purposely stripped out of it. If you look at how they constructed the new Mass, it has become a generic Christian liturgical service. It is man-centered and people-centered. And if any of you have witnessed it, you know that that's true. In addition, the post-conciliar age has been characterized by bizarre and almost insane liturgical practices, something that could not even have been imagined before Vatican II. Masses involving clowns, balloons, bizarre music, dancing, and many, many other events that happen regularly throughout the world. I saw a video once of one of these masses. It was a Halloween mass, and the person that was distributing communion was in the costume of the devil with horns and, and tail, everything. And you could, make, you could talk about those things for hours. They're all over the world. They happen constantly. Things that are weird and sick happening in our sanctuaries that were built for the Holy Mass. There has been a true invasion of the profane into the once hallowed Catholic sanctuary, which knew only the very sacred and otherworldly rites of the traditional Latin Mass, Gregorian chant, and other very sacred sounding music. Another liturgical change which is offensive to many Catholics is communion in the hand. Is it any wonder that 70% of those who profess to be Catholic do not believe in the real presence when what purports to be the body of Christ is handed out as if it were a mere bread wafer and treated as such, found on the floor after the new mass? People taking it home in their pockets. Now all this brings us to the question of the great apostasy from the faith. Many Catholics, as they consider these phenomena and many other things which I have not mentioned, have asked themselves, has the Catholic Church gone crazy? <clears throat> Never in its long history has it ever acted, has it acted in this way. To the contrary, it has always been very stable in its teachings, disciplines, and liturgical practices, and has always uplifted man to great heights of sanctity and even to great heights of culture and civilization. It has always drawn people to its fold by this stability, by this changelessness, which human beings naturally associate with God and with the church that he has founded. Continuity is essential to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is making the claim that it and it alone is the church which Christ founded. It furthermore makes the claim based on the promises of Christ found in sacred scripture that it is assisted by the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth, the third person of the Blessed Trinity in the preservation 
and the teaching of the truth and in the making of laws, both disciplinary and liturgical. This is why we believe in the Catholic Church, because of that assistance. If this promise of Christ to his church is true, then the, the evidence of this assistance would be both an infallibility of doctrine, that is, an absolute continuity of doctrine, both dogmatic and moral, and an indefectibility of the institution, both with regard to its endurance through time, despite persecution, and with regard to its changelessness in respect to all of its essential elements. We are not saying that the Catholic Church can never undergo any change. We're saying that it cannot undergo any essential change. It does respond to different needs of different times in its disciplines. But these are never essential changes. The, the church can never change essentially, just like a tree that grows. Yes, becomes bigger and, and responds to winter, summer, fall, etc. But it never undergoes essential changes. Consequently, the church's absolute continuity in all of its essential elements, which are doctrine, liturgy, and discipline, is a necessary consequence of its assistance by the Holy Ghost in fulfillment of the promises of Christ. So my point is the changelessness of the Catholic Church is an effect of this assistance of the Holy Ghost and is a sign of its truth. If it were to lose this continuity, it would be a sign that it does not have the assistance of the Holy Ghost and that consequently it is not the church founded by Christ. Those who have retained the Catholic virtue of faith in these times are implicitly aware of this need of continuity. And for this reason, they are deeply troubled to see what is happening to the Catholic Church and wonder what they ought to do about it. In the second epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, St. Paul speaks about a great apostasy from the faith. Now, the context is this. He's speaking to the Thessalonians who are saying, the second coming of Christ will be shortly, in a few days or a few years. He's saying, no, 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 you're all wrong. That certain things have to happen before the second coming of Christ. And listen to what he says. And we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and of our gathering together unto him, that you be not easily moved from your sense, nor be terrified, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by epistle, as sent from us, as if the day of the Lord were at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for unless there come a revolt first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth, and is lifted up above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself as if he were God. Remember you not, that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Now, what is the meaning of this revolt that he refers to, or in Greek, apostasy? In general, the fathers of the church and the commentators of sacred scripture all through history say that it refers to the, a general falling away from the faith toward the last times. And you see that St. Paul connects it very tightly with the Antichrist, the man of sin, the man of perdition. Listen to the Catechism of the Council of Trent written in the, the mid-1500s. The sacred scriptures inform us that the general judgment will be preceded by these principal signs, three principal signs, the preaching of the gospel throughout the whole world, a falling away from the faith, and the coming of Antichrist. So three things. When, those three, when that catechism was written, none of those things had taken place. 
Now, two have taken place. The preaching of the gospel to the whole world, which was accomplished under the reign of Pope Pius XI, and the falling away from the faith has been accomplished. The next is the Antichrist. It continues, This gospel of the kingdom, says our Lord, shall be preached in the whole world for a testimony to all nations, and then shall the consummation come. The apostle also, meaning St. Paul, also admonishes us that we be not seduced by anyone as if the day of the Lord were at hand. That means the last judgment. For unless there come a revolt first and the man of sin be revealed, the judgment will not come. St. Thomas Aquinas says that the revolt or the apostasy means that there will be a defection from the Catholic faith of the Roman Church. And the theologian Pola, writing around 1900, who is just one of many who write about this, calls the great apostasy a, quote, tremendous defection among the faithful, and that it will, unquote, and that it will be, quote, partly as a cause and partly as an effect of the appearance of Antichrist. Both events may be reckoned among the signs that are to precede the Last Judgment because it is certain that either before or after the conversion of nations and of the Jewish race, there will be a great revolt led by Antichrist which will reduce the number of the faithful." Unquote. Now, St. Gregory the Great, who died in, I think, 604, so he's writing in the late 500s, he talked about the last times in his uh, book entitled The Moralia. And he, uh, first of all, says that the hierarchy will defect. Listen to what he says. Quote, the church is, as it were, destroyed on every side and undone in her weak members when those very ones that seem strong are brought to ruin, when the crown is taken away from the head. That is, when the rewards of eternity are neglected even by those set at the head, unquote. Uh, he makes reference to the bottomless pit mentioned in the Apocalypse chapter 20, verse 3. Listen, this is St. Gregory the Great. Quote, the last days of Holy Church should be denoted when persecution increasing she is forced to bear the undisguised voices of heretics, when those motions of their hearts, which they now cover up with the depths of their thoughts, they then disclose in the utterance of error made manifest. For now, as it is said by John, the dragon is imprisoned and held fast in the bottomless pit. That's the quote from the Apocalypse. Because the wickedness of the devil is hidden from sight in their crafty hearts, but as is there said, the dragon shall be brought forth out of the bottomless pit, because whatsoever is now covered over from fear, then against the church openly out of the hearts of the wicked is all that serpent's venom brought to light. He says, the weak will fall from the faith. Quote, for then persecution forcing thereto she sees multitudes of the frail fall from her, whom now as a mother she cherishes as her little ones within the bosom of peace, and keeps close within the quiet cradles of faith, seeing that being mixed with the strong, they are numbered by the very tranquil tranquility of the faith. But then, meaning the last times, many such are destined to fall." Unquote. Then he predicts persecutions from fellow Catholics. Quote, towards the end of time, the church will suffer cruel persecutions on the part of those who appear to be from among the faithful. Appear to be. He also says in relation to that, quote, it is therefore at the right of the East that the calamities will rise up, which will afflict the church because they will come to her on the part of those who appear to be among the number of the elect of Jesus Christ. It is said that these calamities rose up suddenly alongside of her to the extent that they come from those who were inside the bosom of the church and before having separated themselves from her 
became as if strangers to her, unquote. And he says that in the last times, the church will suffer persecutions, which will be very dangerous for her weak members. Quote, yet most of them will succumb. The perfect will find themselves sufficiently strong to resist, but will be crushed with sadness and pain because of these persecutions. And he says the church will lose its beauty because an unfaithful hierarchy will persecute the Catholics. Quote, when those who were accustomed to behave with exactitude and fidelity concerning the management of exterior things which had been confided to them, meaning the hierarchy, turn against the elect of God in order to persecute them with violence, it is true that the skin of the church has lost its beauty and its brightness of justice and has contracted the blackness of iniquity, unquote. Is that not what we see? The church disfigured by the blackness of iniquity. And it was predicted by St. Gregory the Great in the 6th century. Now, how did all of this take place, this apostasy? How did a church which remained changeless for 2,000 years suddenly go wild, repudiating its past and embrace these new doctrines? How is it that so many of those who lay claim to the name Catholic do not profess the truths which the Catholic Church teaches? The answer lies in the heresy of modernism. In the latter part of the 19th century, there arose in the church a movement of heresy known as modernism. Its goal was to transform the church in such a way that it would be, be in conformity with the modern world, which was the goal of Vatican II, the expressed goal of Vatican II. All things were subject to the general law of updating in conformity with the modern thinking. Doctrines, disciplines, liturgy, apologetics, scripture, church history. St. Pius X, who reigned from 1903 to 1914, saw the grave dangers of the heresy and termed it the synthesis of all heresies. And he said this, quote, there has never been a time when this watchfulness, referring to his own duty, uh, of the supreme pastor was not necessary to the Catholic body, for owing to the efforts of the enemy of the human race, there have never been lacking men of perverse uh, men speaking perverse things, vain talkers and seducers, erring and driving into error. It must, however, be confessed that these latter days have witnessed a notable increase in the number of the enemies of the cross of Christ, who by arts entirely new and full of deceit are striving to destroy the vital en energy of the church and, listen, as far as is in them lies, utterly to subvert the very kingdom of Christ meaning the Catholic Church, that is the kingdom of Christ on earth, utterly to subvert it. He said this in 1907. He continues, that we should act without delay in this matter is made imperative, especially by the fact that the partisans of error are to be sought not only among the church's open enemies, but what is to be most dreaded and deplored in her very bosom and are more mischievous the less they keep in the open. We allude, venerable brethren, to many who belong to the Catholic laity, and what is much more said to the ranks of the priesthood itself, who, animated by false zeal for the church, lacking the solid safeguards of philosophy and theology, nay, more thoroughly imbued with the poisonous doctrines taught by the enemies of the church, and lost to all sense of modesty, put themselves forward as reformers of the church, unquote. He continues, nor indeed would he be wrong in regarding them as the most pernicious 
of all the adversaries of the church. For as we have said, they put into operation their designs for her undoing, not from without, but from within. Hence, the, he continues, the danger is present almost in the very veins and heart of the church, whose injury is the more certain from the fact that their knowledge of her is the more intimate. Moreover, they lay the axe not to the branches and shoots, but to the very root, that is, to the faith and its deepest fibers. And once having struck at this root of immortality, they proceed to diffuse poison throughout the whole tree, so that there is no part of Catholic truth which they leave untouched, none that they do not strive to corrupt. St. Pius X pointed out that one of the principal errors of the modernists is that it reduced faith, modernism reduced faith to a merely subjective religious experience. In so doing, it ruined the Catholic notion of the virtue of faith. Faith is not a trust in God, as the Protestants make it, or some subjective religious experience, but is instead a very unemotional assent of the intellect to truths which have a divine guarantee. How do we know that these truths come from God? Because the Catholic Church proposes them through the, her infallible magisterium. How do we know that the Catholic Church is from God? For a number of reasons. First, we know that Christ intended to found a church and that it would last until the end of time. He said, Behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world. These words of Christ indicate that the church would survive his apostles and that it would endure until the end of time. Consequently, the church of Christ must be somewhere upon the earth. Second, we can identify this church by comparing the organizations which claim to be the Church of Christ to the Church which Christ intended. These characteristics of the Church of Christ go under the heading of the four marks of the Church. That is, one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. Only the Catholic Church meets the criteria. The others do not measure up. Third, Roman Catholicism corresponds to all of the truths of natural religion. That is, those truths which are obvious to us uh, from reason concerning the nature of God and morality. So it upholds all of the natural law. Fourth, the Roman Catholic religion teaches doctrines which are holy and has never taught a single doctrine which is contrary to revelation or good morals. Its moral code is the highest of any religion on the face of the earth. It is the only religion on earth to not permit divorce and remarriage. Fifth, Roman Catholicism fulfills all of the aspirations and hopes of mankind concerning the living of a virtuous life on this earth and the attainment of eternal happiness in heaven. And sixth, the Catholic Church has proven itself to be the true Church of Christ because of its wondrous life, inasmuch as it has preserved sacred doctrine for centuries without the slightest deviation, has withstood persecution by its enemies, and has emerged therefrom with greater vigor, and has propagated itself with amazing speed, strength, and perseverance despite obstacles which, from the natural point of view, were insurmountable. These and other signs which point out to anyone who approaches the church with a reasonable mind that the Catholic Church and it alone is the true mouthpiece of God and that its testimony concerning God must be heeded. The truths of the faith, by their very nature, are absolute and unchanging. They are also sacred, as sacred as the very essence and holiness of God himself. 
from which these truths emanate. Our ascent to these truths is a form of worship of the true God. It is, in fact, the first and essential step toward true worship, that is, the acceptance of Catholic truth. For we cannot please God without the ascent of faith to the dogmas of the Catholic Church. St. Paul said, without faith it is impossible to please God. Our Lord said to Pilate, for this was I born, and for this came I into the world, that I should give testimony to the truth. He therefore declares the importance <clears throat> of adhering to truth, because it is the motive of his coming into the world. The ascent of faith to divine truth, therefore, is the first step toward our redemption, and without it there is no redemption, no sanctification for us. Our Lord had to die because of divine truth. The Jews said to Pilate, we have a law, and according to the law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. in St. Matthew. The Catholic Church, being guided as it is by the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Ghost, has always understood the importance of teaching the truth and of adhering to it as an essential part of its mission. For this reason, the Catholic Church has always been perfectly consistent in its teachings and has always guarded the purity of, of faith. <clears throat> by the condemnation of heresy and the ejection of heretics from the church. Read the history of the church. In so doing, it has always preserved the unity of faith, which is one of its essential unities. Indeed, the most basic of its three unities, which are unity of faith, unity of government, and unity of worship. That means that every Catholic who lays claim to the name Catholic must profess the same truths, the same faith that is proposed by the Catholic Church for all ages. It has a sameness throughout all time and in all lands. That is essential to the Catholic Church. And this is what we mean when we say in the creed, we believe in one church. We believe in that unity, which is the effect of the assistance of the Holy Ghost to the church. The church has seen many heresies in the course of its long existence, but it has never seen a heresy which denies the very notion and possibility of truth. Such a heresy is the heresy of modernism, which gave us this great apostasy, the one which we face today. It goes under many names, relativism, subjectivism, skepticism, pluralism, call it what you want. It is all the same. It is to say that truth has no domain outside of our own minds, that we make the truth for ourselves. Whatever we hold to be true, we hold as a purely personal conviction which has no public force or value. Such a system strips from truth its essential characteristics with the result that we think or believe what we think or believe are not truths at all but are mere subjective fantasies. For truth, by its very nature, is the conformity of the mind to the object. Consequently, truth is essentially objective. That is, it is the same for all. Strip this objectivity from truth, and you destroy truth itself. Owing to this objectivity, truth, by its very nature, rejects and, and destroys what is against it, that is, whatever contradicts it. So to say God exists, for example, rejects and destroys the opposite proposition, God does not exist. Those two things cannot remain in the mind unopposed. The one rules out the other. By analogy, Light, by its very nature, excludes darkness, and a light which does not exclude darkness is no light at all. Because the faith concerns religious truth revealed by God, its objectivity 
is all the more enhanced since its certitude is absolute and unalterable. Adherence to the truths of the faith, therefore, is a worship of God, a recognition of his truth as pertaining to his divine essence. Consequently, the recognition of the objectivity of his truth is an essential part of divine worship. That is to say, in a word, that the Catholic faith is not some mere personal conviction, not some internal experience of God, but is divinely revealed, absolutely certain, and thoroughly objective truth, which must be accepted by all under pain of eternal damnation. Relativism came to us from Protestantism. Protestantism says that every man, when he reads sacred scripture, is inspired by the Holy Ghost to know its true meaning. If this were really true, then everyone who reads scripture would hold to the same truths because the Holy Ghost cannot contradict himself. But the opposite thing occurred with Protestantism. For as many Protestants there are, there are interpretations of sacred scripture. And this religion became, over time, a hodgepodge of conflicting and contradictory ideas, all supposedly inspired by the Holy Ghost. From this insanity came the idea that truth is merely a personal thing and that no one can impose his own truth on someone else. It is also necessary in this system to respect another's truth, however different from your own. For the, by the 18th century, this pernicious doctrine of relativism of truth became the mainstream of popular thought even among some Catholics. The idea gained traction in the, 19th and in the 19th and 20th centuries, especially as man cared less about religion and more about money and inventions. It fit the modern world perfectly. Modernism made a system out of the relativization of truth, saying that by reason we cannot know for certain any religious truths and that all religion proceeds from a subjective religious experience. Vatican II set out to conform the church to the modern world. This conformity took place principally by the relativizing of Catholic dogma, by applying the absurdity of Protestantism to the structures of Catholicism which were built to radiate divine and utterly objective, absolute, an unchanging truth to the whole world. The great basilica of St. Peter's was built for Catholic truth. It was not built for relativistic modernism. And if they were to build a St. Peter's today, what would it look like? This relativization of Catholic dogma took place in the form of ecumenism, which says that non-Catholic religions have value in the order of salvation indeed are means of salvation. Why is this so? Because according to the tenets of relativism, the Catholic Church has no right to impose its creeds and dogmas upon others, but only to display them as if in a tent at a public fair, as one of many paths to God. From what has been said, it is clear that ecumenism, which is the result of Vatican II, is a dogma killer and a faith killer. It destroys the essence of divine truth because it destroys its objectivity. All of the effects of Vatican II can be seen in this relativization of truth. The present condition of the Catholic Church is, is, is a reality because in its veins has been injected this relativization of truth. <clears throat> The new mass is the effect of ecumenism, since it eliminates from so-called Catholic worship anything that is offensive to Protestants. There is among the Novosordites no longer any unity of faith. We pointed this, <clears throat> you can believe whatever you want with impunity in the Novosorda religion. Religious liberty is also a natural consequence 
the Catholic faith does not have the right to exclude error in society, but must take its place side by side with false religions. The collegiality of bishops is another result, since it is the elimination of the papacy, which pleases Protestants, who hate the papacy, all in the name of ecumenism, which is merely relativism in, in regard to dogma. The natural practical effect of relativism is pluralism and what is commonly called tolerance. Pluralism is a sauce which is placed on every truth which instantly relativizes it. So we hear of Catholic politicians who say, I am personally against abortion, but I cannot st stop someone who believes in it from getting one. That is pluralism. It means, well, I adhere to the truth, but it has no teeth. Tolerance is considered the greatest virtue today, the highest form of charity. You have to tolerate everything by which we approve of or at least permit everything in the name of relativism. The true notion of tolerance, tolerance is to not punish an evil in order to obtain a greater good or to avoid a worse evil. But in some cases, to tolerate an evil is a grave sin of imprudence. It is not always right to tolerate. We understand from what I have said that the modern world has a new God and a new religion, that of relativism. It, is, it has one simple dogma, there is no objective truth. Its moral code is pluralism, or at least tolerance, to permit every moral aberration under the sun, no matter how evil it is. We are presently witnessing relativism in action by the approval of sodomitic marriages. Relativism demands that society approve of it. It is, the, it is only consistent with its principles. Because the sin of Sodom is so obviously contrary to everything decent and basic in human beings, however, society's approval of this horrid sin shows an almost unbelievable perversion of the human intellect. As much as the sin of Sodom is a perversion of the body, what is yet worse is the perversion of the mind that must take place in order to approve of it. The sin of society approving of it is far, far greater than the sins of those who commit those actions. Far greater. For the mind is made more for objective truth than male is made for female. And the reason why modernists and liberals approve of sodomy is not because they see it as right, because nobody in his right mind could see that as right, but only because they want to preserve their own freedom from the law of nature and the law of God. Relativism is, in the natural order, a perverse error when it is applied to God and the things of God in the form of ecumenism and religious liberty it is a blasphemy against the truth and holiness of Almighty God. Now, what should Catholics do in reaction to this great apostasy? Excuse me for one moment. It is first of all necessary that Catholics reflect on what is happening to their churches. Is the Catholic faith still in them? When you go to church on Sunday, is the Catholic faith there? Is that Catholic worship? Does it please God to worship God according to the new mass? Does this new religion have the four marks of the Catholic Church? It's certainly new. In order to answer these questions, we must first go back to a more fundamental question and answer it, and that is this. Are the changes of Vatican II accidental or substantial changes? 
The church has always gone through accidental changes, as I said. It has always reacted in various ways to the different times. It is not to say that the Catholic Church is static, but it has always remained essentially the same. And so the burning question is, are the changes accidental or substantial? John XXIII and other prime movers of the Second Vatican Council assured us in the 1960s, because I remember it, I was a teenager in the 1960s, that the Second Vatican Council would change nothing substantial in the church, but would simply express the traditional doctrines in new ways, so as to make them easier to understand for the modern mind. I remember it distinctly. Likewise, certain disciplinary and liturgical changes would take place, they said, which would be merely changes of form, but not of substance. And that's key. Every Catholic believed that this was true. As the changes of Vatican II were gradually imposed, they were always coated with this same assertion that there was nothing substantially new. They said it all the time. In other words, there was no substantial break with the past because that is key, as I said, for the Catholic Church. It cannot have a substantial break with the past. Even those who were uncomfortable with the changes of Vatican II accepted them, however reluctantly, on the principle that the Catholic hierarchy said that nothing was substantially changed. Gradually, as the changes unfolded, however, many people began to see them as more than merely accidental. For this reason, a traditional movement sprang up in the church. And there emerged from this traditional movement three groups. The first is those who accepted wholeheartedly, uh, not, excuse me, there emerged three groups after Vatican II. First, those who accepted wholeheartedly the doctrinal disciplinary and liturgical changes of Vatican II. So there's most of the people who call themselves Catholics today think that all of the changes of Vatican II are wonderful, think that uh, Francis is wonderful and the best thing that ever happened to the church. It's my experience in talking to them and the polls agree with that. So that's most of the people that call themselves Catholics. The second group after Vatican II is composed of those who accepted these changes with reluctance, finding them abhorrent, and who sought to establish within the legal structures a place for tradition. And the third group is those who have utterly refused to have anything to do with the reforms, perceiving them as a new religion, and who have conducted an active resistance to them. We will call the first category the Novus Ordo Catholics. The second category, the Novus Ordo Conservatives, and the third category, the Sede Vacantists. We place in the second category, that is the Novus Ordo Conservatives, those who aspire to have a place of tradition within the Novus Ordo structures, such as the Society of St. Pius X and similar groups. <clears throat> the principles which animate them are the same. That is, Fraternity of St. Peter, Christ the King. Uh, they are already part of the modernist uh, hierarchical, uh, in a, in a, they are approved by the modernist hierarchy, and the Society of St. Pius X aspires to have that approval, and probably will gain it very, very soon. But since all change is either accidental or substantial, as I said, and there is no middle ground between those things, let us examine the positions of these groups. Just as, for example, a tree changes in spring and summer and fall, it remains the same tree. But if I burn it down, that's a substantial change. So did Vatican II burn down the Catholic faith, or is it merely a, an accidental change? The first group, the massive number of people who accept the changes wholeheartedly, the Novus Ordo Catholics, they regard the changes as purely accidental, or if they see them as substantial, as many do, they don't care. 
They welcome these changes. They see them as a break with the past. Many Novus Ordo Catholics readily admit that the changes of Vatican II have substantially altered the Catholic religion. And they are happy about it. And in this, they are not distinguished from the followers of Martin Luther or other reformers who have substantially altered the Catholic religion. Novus Ordo Catholics comprise about 95% of those who call themselves Catholics. The second group holds that there are no substantial changes in Vatican II or its reforms, but at the same time hold that Vatican II is ambiguous and needs to be properly interpreted. They hold that the new mass and other liturgical changes, while valid and Catholic, are nevertheless imperfect and even seriously imperfect. And they hold that the disciplinary changes are also imperfect and in need of reform. In all cases, however, the Novus Ordo conservative does not have an intrinsic objection to any of the doctrines or reforms of Vatican II. They do accept them as Catholic and are willing to function side by side with them under the Novus Ordo hierarchy. The, there are many groups that already do this, and as I said, the Society of St. Pius X aspires to do this. The third group, those who completely reject the uh, uh, reforms of Vatican II as a new religion, contrary to faith, they hold that the doctrinal, liturgical, and disciplinary changes of Vatican II are indeed substantial, and that they constitute a whole new religion. They hold as a consequence that the promulgators of this new religion do not have the authority of Christ and therefore do not constitute a true Catholic hierarchy. They say this because it is impossible by the indefectibility of the Catholic Church, which is guaranteed by the Holy Ghost, that the authority of Christ, which is the same as the authority of the Pope, as Pope Pius XII said, promulgate to the whole world something that is contrary to Catholic faith and practice. If there is something defective, in other words, it's not the Catholic Church. It is the members of the hierarchy that promulgate the false religion. So you see that before anyone can answer the very first question, is the religion in my church Catholic? <clears throat> and whether it is true that remaining in the Novus Ordo structures is the correct way of combating the changes of Vatican II. In order to answer those questions, the more fundamental question must be answered. We would just go in circles if we did not answer that fundamental question. Is Vatican II a new religion, or is it just an accidental change? For I would concede that if one holds the changes of Vatican II to be merely accidental, then no matter how imperfect you should think they are, they could be accepted and indeed must be accepted. We would have no right to object to them. To accept these changes, however, and fight for tradition within the Novus Ordo does not make any sense. To say the Novus Ordo religion is a false religion, but at the same time I want to work with it and be involved in its structures makes no sense at all. Are we merely fighting for aesthetics, that is, Latin and incense and beautiful vestments? Or are we fighting for the faith, the Catholic faith? For they, the modernists will let you have the incense and, and the Latin and the chant. They'll let you have all of that because that meets your sensitivities, they say. But do these Novus Ordo conservatives, are they there merely for that? Are they there merely for the trappings? But is there not something deeper in the Novus Ordo conservative movement? None of them that I know of will go to the new mass. They avoid it like the plague because there's something wrong with it. They will travel for miles to obtain a traditional Latin mass. They will go into dangerous neighborhoods to have it. They believe in what they call a hermeneutic of continuity, that is, an interpretation of Vatican II that is in accordance with 
with Catholic tradition. No one has come up with that. It is a mythological god, the hermeneutic of continuity. No one has said this is the key of linking Vatican II to the previous doctrines. No one. But they believe in it. I've talked to them. I've talked to Novus Ordo priests. They believe in this, this invisible thing that someone will come up with one day, like a unicorn in the, in the forest. After 50 years, no one has figured it out. But they reject the official interpretation of Vatican II, the one that has been given by Paul VI, John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and others. Such positions betray in their actions what they do not admit in their words. Why are the Novus Ordo conservatives rejecting the Novus Ordo? Why are they rejecting the official interpretation of Vatican II? Why do they hold to this dreamy hermeneutic of continuity? It is because they know in their hearts that these are substantial changes to the Catholic religion. They also know that if they admit that they, that they are substantial changes, they must logically become sedevacantists. But they find sedevacantism to be something horrid. Hence, they seek to find Catholicism somewhere <clears throat> in the Novus Ordo and try to establish a place in, in the Novus Ordo, a side chapel of tradition in the modernist cathedral so that they can lead a Catholic life, so to speak, without the annoyance of the Novus Ordo and the changes of Vatican II. Consequently, in 2007, the traditional Latin Mass was permitted by a motu proprio issued by Benedict XVI, not because of the doctrinal problems of the new Mass, but because of, as he said, the sensibilities of some who prefer the traditional forms. In other words, the traditional Latin Mass was permitted for modernist reasons. Novus Ordo conservatives believe in the hermeneutic of continuity, that is, a, a, an interpretation of Vatican II and its reforms, which makes it compatible with the pre-Vatican II Catholicism. <clears throat> is the hermeneutic of continuity a real solution, even if it were possible, and even if it were found? No, because the Vatican II popes have already given an interpretation to Vatican II which is entirely unorthodox, such as religious liberty and ecumenism, not only by their words but by their actions, like John Paul II's kissing of the Koran, which says that God does not have a son. It even says he cannot have a son. The whole ecumenical movement with its abominations against the first commandment of God are testimony to the interpretation which the Novus Ordo authorities give to the documents of Vatican II. To devise some sort of Catholic interpretation of Vatican II, if it were even possible, would not solve any problems since the Catholic interpretation would have to sit side by side with the unorthodox interpretations of the Council. The unorthodox interpretations are already set in stone by the post-Vatican II magisterium and praxis of the Vatican II so-called popes. Hence, the solution for the Novus Ordo conservative is that there be two interpretations of Vatican II, one conservative, the other liberal, and unorthodox. Consequently, within one church, there would be an orthodox branch and an unorthodox branch and that is contrary to the unity and continuity of the Catholic Church. Any Catholic can see that such a solution is not a solution at all. The unity of the Catholic Church, and most especially her doctrinal unity, is an essential characteristic of the Roman Catholic Church. The Catholic Church could never tolerate within its walls two groups who interpret a general council in two different ways which contradict each other. Where is the spirit of God and the spirit of truth in such a church? It's just like a Protestant church. The Novus Ordo conservative, therefore, must decide what is the answer to the first and most fundamental question. 
are the doctrinal, liturgical, and disciplinary changes of Vatican II substantial or accidental? Are they rupture with the past or are they continuity with the past? If these changes are continuity with the past, then how bad could they be? Why do we need a traditional movement if they can deserve the label of Catholic? The, the, the word Catholic is so defined that if you can put that label on the changes of Vatican II, we don't need to do anything about them. We may like them or dislike them, but if they're Catholic, they must be accepted. <clears throat> Catholicism, <clears throat> consequently, if there is continuity between pre-Vatican II Catholicism and post-Vatican II Catholicism, then there is no problem in the church. It's all imaginary. If these changes are not continuity with the past, on the other hand, then obviously the Novus Ordo conservative solution must be rejected. If, in fact, Vatican II and the Novus Ordo hierarchy have imposed a new religion upon the structures of the Catholic Church, then no Catholic can accept the new religion and cooperate with it in any way. He cannot give assent to the new religion, either by word or by action. It would be against the first commandment. In such a case, to remain within the structures would be to assent to the new religion, at least by action. Furthermore, to work outside of the Novus Ordo structures is in no way to leave the Catholic Church, as we are accused of. The structures of the Catholic Church exist for the doctrine and the true sacraments of the Catholic Church. And when I say structures, I'm talking about not only physical structures, but the legal structures. Why do they exist? They exist for Catholic truth, Catholic sacraments. They were built for that. They were set up for that by our Lord Jesus Christ. They have no other purpose for existence. The authority governing the church exists for the protection and the promotion of these things. If the persons elected and designated to these positions of authority betray the very reason for the existence of the, of the authority, it is obviously obvious that they no longer possess the authority. Consider that pilot who drove the plane right into the side of the mountain. He perverted the very reason of his existence as a pilot. And if they could have gotten into that cockpit, they would have ripped him out right away because he lost all of his authority to pilot that plane because he perverted the very end of the, the and goal and reason for having had that permission to fly that plane. So also, if the Novus Ordo hierarchy is giving us a new religion, they are perverting the very end and purpose of receiving authority. If the structures are established for the faith, the legal structures of the Catholic Church, then it does not constitute a schism from the Catholic Church to flee from heretics who are operating those structures. It's like an enemy occupying a country. They occupy them, but they do not, those structures do not belong to them. By analogy, if heretics take over a Catholic church building and install heretical rites and doctrines in it, as happened during the Reformation, the only thing to do is to walk out of the building until the Catholic faith is back in it. That's the only Catholic thing to do. There is no spirit of schism in such a case, but only the will to protect oneself from the heretics. In other words, if in fact the Novus Ordo hierarchs are forcing upon the church a new religion, it is impossible that they enjoy the authority of Christ, since to do so would destroy the very reason of existence for their authority. Hence, there is nothing for the Catholic to do except to flee from the false shepherd. In so doing, they are not in any way exiting from the Catholic Church. To the contrary, they are bearing witness against the false shepherds. As St. Athanasius said, they have the churches, we have the faith. A person leaves the church through schism or heresy, but the Sede Vacantis Catholic is neither schismatic nor heretical, and therefore he does not leave the church. 
He is not schismatic since he is forever subject to the Roman pontiff and awaits a true Catholic pope. He is not heretical because he adheres to all of the truths of the Catholic faith. The reason why we must undertake an action outside of the Novus Ordo structures is that unfortunately the Novus Ordo hierarchy is in possession of our churches and other institutions, but they do not have authority if they are imposing a new religion. All of these considerations boil down to the essential and most fundamental question, are the doctrines, liturgy, and disciplines of the Novus Ordo religion continuity with the past or rupture with the past? Are the changes of Vatican II substantial changes or accidental changes? To work within the Novus Ordo structures, to be subjected to the Novus Ordo hierarchy, seeking from them a permission to have a truly Catholic life means that the Novus Ordo changes must pass into history as being a legitimate development of Roman Catholicism. It means that all of the magisterium, so to speak, of the Vatican II popes, so to speak, must be included side by side with that of all the pre-Vatican II popes. That what I read today concerning Bergoglio, what he said, that there is no Catholic God, must stand side by side with the teaching of St. Pius X and St. Pius V and all of the councils of the Catholic Church. Because it comes from the mouth of a pope who's teaching. All of the allocutions of Bergoglio as well as all of the encyclicals and apostolic exhortations that he has made, must take their place in the canon of the church's teaching. And while one may argue that they are not infallible teaching, it is nevertheless inescapable that they are what theologians call the authentic teaching, and it is all considered to be magisterium and demands at least our religious assent according to canon law. The Novus Ordo conservative has nothing to stand on since if the changes are continuity, he should accept them. Go to the new mass. Don't bother with the pretty vestments. And if they are not continuity, he should reject them. He cannot reject them and at the same time give assent to them by his actions. On the other hand, if he accepts them as Catholic, he ruins the logical basis of his resistance to them. Why should we give any resistance to the changes of Vatican II if they are in accordance with Catholicism? And if Vatican II is rupture, then we say to Vacantis hold that it, and we say to Vacantis hold that it is, then the council and all that has flowed from the council must be considered alien to Roman Catholicism. It must be considered the work of intruders, heretical intruders, who can lay no claim to legitimate authority and therefore lay no claim to our obedience. In the history of the church, whenever a heresy or schism arises, if the hierarchy is promoting it, nearly all the people follow the heretical and schismatical hierarchy. The examples are the Arian heresy, or the schism of Photius in the East, or the Protestant revolt in the West, on the other hand, when the hierarchy rejects and represses this heresy or schism, it has little success. Examples are the Waldenses in the Middle Ages. You don't know who they are because they were suppressed by the hierarchy. Or the Hussites, you don't know who they are because they were suppressed. Or the old Catholics of the 19th century, an obscure group because the hierarchy suppressed them. And the modernists, whom the hierarchy also suppressed but unfortunately not enough. And we are living in an age in which the body of those designated to be the hierarchy has embraced the heresies of Vatican II. It is to be expected that 95% of those calling themselves Catholics have defected to it because the hierarchy has told them to do so. Those who have received the grace to know that Vatican II is rupture should not seek to compromise with the heresy but should utterly reject it and reject those who promulgate it. In so doing, they do not impose upon God or the church some human solution of compromise with heresy as if it were a political solution, but are remaining perfectly faithful 
to the religion of their baptisms and are leaving to God's providence the solution of the problem. It is his church. It is the spirit of God that directs it. Leave it to God. You have your duty of preserving the Catholic faith. God will do the rest. It is our job to preserve the faith, and God has given us the means to do so. He has raised up bishops who have consecrated other bishops and have given us Catholic priests. Find them and go to Mass and receive the sacraments from them. Let us flee the heretics, preserve the faith, and thereby become apt instruments of a true restoration of Roman Catholicism in Catholic structures and institutions. If you read in, in the book of Joshua, <coughs> Judges, excuse me, in the book of Judges, 30,000 showed up at the call of Gideon to fight the Amorites. God got rid of 99% of them. He took 300. The rest went home. He sent them home, and with those 300, he performed a miracle with them of driving off a huge number of Amorites because he wanted to show his power and not the power of human beings. And what made him chose those 300 was their aptness, their faith, to be true instruments of God in that. Catholics should, in the practical order, find true Catholic priests who unequivocally and without compromise reject the Novus Order religion and the false hierarchy which promulgates it. They should seek the mass and sacraments and instruction in the faith from these priests and only these priests and should have no truck with the new religion which we commonly call the Novus Ordo. In so doing, they will preserve the holy faith in a time when so many are losing it, and in a time when the forces of Antichrist are gathering strength and organizing themselves, both religiously and politically, into something that will inflict upon the church its greatest persecution of all time. In summary, I will close. I have shown what is wrong with the post-Vatican II Catholicism, what we call the Novus Ordo religion. I have shown its relationship to the great apostasy predicted by St. Paul and St. Gregory the Great. I have pointed out the origin of this apostasy, which is modernism and the relativization of truth. And I have pointed out what a Catholic must do to flee from the modernist heretic and to unmask the hierarchy which promulgates it as a false hierarchy. Thank you for listening.